Hi, I'm Ed Spurling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Frank Furrow. We're going to talk today about memory and the edge. Frank, when you think about the edge, most people always think about OIoT, the little devices that people put in their pockets or uh, use around the house or whatever it happens to be, some consumer device. But the reality is there's a massive build-out going on right now inside the data centers there too, right? So we have this enormous space, which could include a car, it could include a uh, handheld uh, device, it could also include a server or s multiple levels of servers. So what happens on the edge there? What's going on with memory? We typically think about a lot of the processing that gets done up in the cloud, and then that, proce that, that processors or that, uh, those AI models eventually get pushed down into the edge and get pushed down into your uh, end devices, but that's not a very efficient way to do things. So having the ability to, to process uh, at each of those points in the network, whether it's at the endpoint in some of the devices you just mentioned, like a car, or at the edge of the network, or back up into the data center, and not having to move that data all the way through. Because when we move the data, of course, it's, it's, it costs processing, and it's also power. Every time you move something through the data center, you're, you're, spending, uh, you're spending power. So then how do we get some of that same processing power up in the, that's up in the data center you know, out through the edge of the network? So let's take a closer look. Okay. How do we get more processing at the edge? Okay, so, okay, so first let me uh, talk about some of the trade-offs that systems have to make when they're trying to size their, um, their architecture. So one of the things that is very critical is your memory bandwidth. And if you're processing up in the data center, typically you're going to need processing in the ter terabyte uh, kind of range. As you move to the edge, though, you don't have the luxury of spending those kinds of uh, uh, both money and power on those very high performance systems. So as we move out toward the edge, you're going to need to get more efficient memory systems. And of course, when you're in an end device, even a you know a handheld, you're going to want a much more economical kind of system. So how do you balance those those types of systems where you get very high performance, you know, mid range performance, and then very uh, lower performance, but still uh, have good efficiency. And a lot of the questions I get asked by my customers is, you know, what is the right memory for my system? I've got a specific bandwidth need, and I want to pick the memory that gives me the best balance of cost and power and performance. So we came up with this kind of a chart, it's a little bit simplified version, that shows two different uh, attributes of your memory. So the, the first thing usually everyone looks at is bandwidth. So the uh, along the x-axis here, you've got your uh, performance in terms of bandwidth. And on the y-axis here, you've got your capacity. What, how big are those memories? How much can they store? These are just two, two attributes. We also uh, would have to look at, it's kind of too, gets too complicated, but we're certainly going to look at cost and power as well. But these are uh, kind of the, a good starting point uh, for the discussion. Basically, what you're coming down to here is one size does not fit all. What kinds of choices do you have to deal with? Okay, so right uh, here I'm showing uh, four different types of memory choices. These are the uh, uh, main memory. So DDR, uh, DRAM, which is, you know, the DDR, DRAM has been around for a long time. It's still uh, the mainstay in, in a lot of applications in your PC and in, in, your, in your servers. And now we're, we're up to DDR5 generation. I'm also showing, uh, uh, again, I'm sorry, it's hard to read a little bit, but this is LPDDR, which is was traditionally your mobile memory and mobile memory was used in your you know, mobile phones and laptops, but now LPDDR is being used you know, beyond the mobile market. We'll talk more about that. I have a GDDR, a graphics DDR. Again, uh, you think of GDDR as something that goes into one of your graphics cards, but like LPDDR, GDDR is being, being uh, used in many other types of applications. And again, I'll talk about why in a minute. And then we have a high bandwidth memory, which is one of the newer memories that's out. I'm, showing here high band HBM3, which is the latest generation of HBM. So these are some of the choices that a, uh, a system architect is going to have to look at when choosing and sizing the right memory. So looking left to right in this chart, is it safe to assume that the left side is going to be the smaller devices, the middle of that is going to be the potential power users, and then the right side will be some of the servers in the data center? That's, that's right. So if you look here at HBM, so typically, you know, these are these are going to be used for your, you know, your AI and training in particular. Okay, so you've got 
AI training is HBM uh, is really where the sweet spot for the application. We also see HBM used in high performance computing as well. And you know why HBM is is uh, is so popular is the, the obvious. You know you can see from the bandwidth here. You're going to get you know with with the DRAM you're going to this particular configuration shows two HBM DRAMs. I'm going to get 1.6 terabytes uh, per second of performance. So you're getting a ton of memory bandwidth performance with HBM. It also gives you pretty good capacity. You got 64 gigabytes capacity, and then with each generation of the HBM, uh, you know the capacity is based on the number of stacks in the DRAM. And vendors are you know are moving you know from eight stacks typically to 12, and even with HBM3 up to 16 stacks. So the, this density can, uh, capacity can continue to to grow, uh, but just and you have a, but you have a lot of pins to deal with. So with HBM, you have uh, in this case two two thousand twenty four pins per per DRAM, and so you have to deal with all that uh, all those pins. So as you said, you call them power users, but yeah. So if I'm doing an AI training algorithm, I'm going to need you know terabytes of memory bandwidth performance, and so I'm going to be willing to kind of build a system that can accommodate uh, HBM. And typically when we thought about training, that was done in the cloud, but it's moving closer to the end user, right? Yeah, that's that's right. If you think about some of these models, they, they are trained in the cloud. They can take days and weeks and months uh, to train. And then as those models train, they do get pushed down into the endpoints. But in some cases, you don't necessarily even want to have to do that, right? If, you, if, if, if it's a simpler uh, uh, network, you can train that right at the edge of the network. And so we have, I have seen cards that will do both AI training and AI inference. And with inference is, is once you've trained the model, then identifying what you've trained is that uh, inference. And so um, some of these edge cards are going to do both. They're going to train and they're going to also infer. What about on the other side of that chart? What happens in terms of the DDR? Yes, yeah, so I mentioned, D so DDR, uh, DDR5 in particular, gives you very good uh, density. And this is, so this, you know, if we look at DDR, this is really where your server, so this is your server DIMMs are going to be uh, ideal for, for DDR5. And if you look at uh, DDR, again, it's, I apologize, it's a little hard to read, but we, this, this uh, chart, I'm showing eight DDR5 DRAMs in the system. So if you look at uh, the bandwidth, that, that'll give you 370 uh, gigabytes of performance, so pretty good uh, performance. Again, 4.8 gigabits per pin is the current is the DDR5 rate. Uh, but you've got, you know, like I said, uh, 2,000 gigabytes of capacity, which is very good. And you have 512 pins to deal with in your system. Pins meaning I've got to put all these DRAMs on my board, or or in this case maybe on a DIM. And so in that case, um, you know, DDR is your kind of memory you have to choose for to give you that balance of performance and capacity. But you also have down here LPDDR, as I mentioned before. So LPDDR also gives you a pretty good, a pretty decent capacity. In this case, I'm using now tw 12 LPDDRs to give you three that same bandwidth. So I got 370 giga uh, uh, bytes of performance. Again, 6.4 gigabits per pin. But this gives you, you know, just under 100 gigabytes of capacity and I've got to deal with 384 pins on my board. So you can see on, you know, on this side of the chart, the uh, DDR and LPDDR give you a pretty good balance of capacity and performance. But if you really start having to hit the performance bandwidth, if someone comes to me and says, I need you know, 500 uh, gigabytes uh, of bandwidth, well, then you can see to, you know, to move these lines out, I'm going to have to add a lot more DRAM. And this is what we're seeing at the edge. So t today, the edge is using DDR type memories, but they're saying, hey, but I, I need, you know, I need something like this in terms of my bandwidth. And, you know, DDR is a great memory, but, you know, if I put down eight, I got to put down maybe 16 of them on a board. Now it's starting to get very unwieldy because you got board area problems. You got to deal with all these pins. And as the speeds are going up, you got signal integrity challenges. So then, you know, at some point you're going to have to kind of break off from that DRAM and go into another solution. HBM might be a simple answer, but you're going to pay for that. And what you're coming down to here is that in the past, we would design things for, let's put in the, the fastest processor, and we'll put in enough memory to be able to, to do this. What you're looking at here, though, is much more specific in terms of this is going into this market for this application, and here's the likely use case of it, right? Correct. So so GDDR gives you a good balance now between it, it 
between using LP DDR DDR where you get the very high density uh, HBM gives you the high performance but GDDR uh, although it's a was originally a graphics memory and, and again it's still being very popular in the graphics market seems like a good balance between the the uh, giving you the performance you need ver and not having to spend for that two and a half D system. So GDR is your traditional die down um, memory. If you look at uh, this example, I've, I've used eight uh, GDDR6 DRAMs. And so that gives you 512 gigabytes per second of performance, a so very, very good bandwidth. And, it, that, and that's again, 16 gigabits per pin. So that, that, so your eight devices, you can do the math there. And then you also get 16 gigabytes of capacity. So again, decent capacity, uh, not a lot, not that many pins to deal with, 256 gig pins. And there are graphics cards uh, uh, you can see on the market that'll have as many as a dozen GDDR6 wrapped around the GPU. So the industry knows how to deal with the pins. It's a, you know, you're, you're still, uh, a lot of signal integrity care has to be taken running 16 gigabits per second, but it, you, you still have the, the staying in the cost profile of a, of a DRAM down on the board. So it's a, it looks like a nice solution for the for the edge of the for the edge. In the past, when we had DDR, uh, any sort of DRAM, it was typically here's the latest version. It's probably not going to change for four or five years, maybe longer, and th then you go into the next one. And by the way, your processor will change multiple times in between. It seems like we're starting to change the memory out as fast as we are the processors, right? Yeah, that's correct. So in the, yeah, in the past, you could you could almost plot you know the DDR right DDR would come out, DDR1, 2, 3, it'd go into the servers, it would go into the PCs, the cost would come down, the next generation, the next generation. But what happens is because of these AI systems, uh, they just have an insatiable uh, need for more memory bandwidth. And that's one of the reasons why both LPDDR, which was uh, LPDDR4 was running at 4.2 gig, started was faster than DDR, was becoming you know a memory to be considered for other applications besides uh, besides mobile. Similarly, GDDR at 16 gig, uh, also much faster, right? four times faster uh, than LPDDR4. So, so this, this gave you know, now a, another option to say, how can we make this work in our system? Because we get the bandwidth we need, we don't have lots of chips on the, lots of DRAMs on the board, and we're still staying in a, a reasonable cost profile. So as architects and design engineers work on these systems, really what you're trying to do is balance how much throughput do we need for data? How much data are we going to have? How fast do we have to process this? What's the, the power budget that we, we can work within? And then also, how do we manage the cost on all this? That's right, so let's go back to the original uh, question around the, the edge of the network. And at, so if you look at the bandwidth requirements at the, at the edge, so typically if you're going to do some kind of AI inference, you know, around 500 uh, gigabytes per second is a nice number. You look at accelerator cards that are out there on the market doing AI inference, that's typically where they are today, maybe maybe between 300 and 500 uh, gigabytes per second. So GDDR fits really nicely into that profile. And, and as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's died down on the board. You don't have to deal with two and a half D. If you look at in the automotive market, you know, where you're doing AI <clears throat> inference in the car, same thing, right? The, the GDDR in the past, they're using maybe DDR, LP DDR. GDDR will allow you to reduce the number of DRAM you need, but increase your performance and stay in that same cost and power profile. So just to put this back in perspective, where does all this stuff actually play? So again, if you think about this chart, if, if you're a system architect and you're trying to choose the right memory, then I think, it, again, there's gray areas, but at least at some level, it's clear that if you're in the, the AI training high end, you're going to want to go with HPM. It's going to cost a little more, but you need that bandwidth. When you're in that maybe grayer area at the edge of the network where you may want to do some low-end training or some in inference, GDDR6 looks like a nice solution because it, it helps keep the amount of DRAM on your board relatively low and it keeps you in that same cost profile. If you're out uh, on the endpoints, you know, whether you're in a phone or, or some other endpoint, then LPDDR looks like a good solution. It gives you the, the kind of bandwidth you need in the, you know, 100 to 300 gigabytes per second, and that's what you need on some of these uh, endpoint devices. Frank Farrell, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.